good to be together again. Thank you for coming. He's right. Back in the day when my wife and I did this kind of work full time, it was uh, five weeks, five nights a week. And uh, this is a real compact um, part, uh, a, a compact idea of that. But uh, I think God has blessed us. I'm sure he's blessed you. He's blessed me. And uh, tonight, our topic is, is God trying to scare hell out of us? Let's take the questions. That, well, I wanted to say, uh, there's a number of people that helped make this happen that you don't even see or hear about. Um, every night, these beautiful flowers. Tonight on the way here, because of the problem out there on 92, uh, they all spilled onto the floor. So they got recovered just wonderfully, don't you think? <laughs> Even though with a bit of frustration. And I'm grateful for there's a, a small group of people that care for the children. I say care for them, have a little program for the children. And bless their hearts, they've done this every night. My wife and I have learned to love you people. It's been very special to be here. And I'm sorry that in a few days we're going to head back to the North Pole. Uh, well, uh, it, it is warming up there a little bit. So, so the questions this evening, um, quickly here, is it against God's will to be cremated? The Bible doesn't speak in any detail, but it's obvious that once uh, we have died, that we return to the dust. And if someone wants to hasten that with a, with a fire, that's just perfectly in line with what actually the Bible sees happens until he resurrects us. How much of the body, I put this word is in there, is water and electrical, and is that a dangerous combination? I'm not sure what this person had in mind. You can weigh the amount of water. It depends on the tissue. Some tissues are 90%, some are much less, but the average is 60. But you cannot weigh electricity. So I'm not sure what the person had in mind, except you don't want to be hooked up to something electrical when you stand in a puddle of water. Maybe that's what they had in mind. But actually, virtually everything that goes on in the body, I, I, could, I could wax eloquent on this, folks, for a week, because uh, that's kind of my world, is uh, wouldn't work without uh, electricity. Uh, every molecule, every atom is electrical in nature. Um, so, but it's certainly not dangerous. If all of a sudden there was no electricity in any atom in our bodies, we would be instantly dead. So, for whatever that's worth, it's in, maybe is interesting to you. Does the body weigh less after death? No. The only thing that changes, and it comes to the other question, a couple of questions, is that when God makes us out of dust, it is his power that makes that dust alive. And that combination is a soul, a living soul. Without the power, all you have is molecules. And that's uh, an amazing thing. And his power doesn't weigh anything, interestingly enough. Um, you, can, you can see its effect. You can be blessed greatly by its presence. But it doesn't weigh anything. Jesus said, into thy hand I commend my spirit. Um, when we die, does God hold our spirit in his mind like software? Well, I answered this in a way already. Uh, it certainly is the case that God knows everyone. He knows everything about everyone. Isn't that wonderful that though he knows all those things in his mercy, you know what he does? He forgives them, and then what does he do? The Bible says he forgets them. It actually, it's a metaphor. It says he puts them at the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> so that's really precious, um, the way he does that. The spirit is just, that, that word means air. You remember that. And it's simply a metaphor for God's power. The metaphor when he made Adam was that he 
breathed or blew air into Adam's lungs. Folks, it was not the air that made Adam live. It was God's power. And this is a mystery. Scientists do not understand this. Uh, it's a mystery when you put all these chemicals together in this tiny, tiny thing that you cannot see except with a microscope. It lives. It's suddenly alive. Uh, amazing, amazing thing. When we get to heaven, I'm going to chemistry class. Would you like to go with me? How many had a hard time with chemistry when you tried to study it? I used to teach it. And uh, uh, I get frustrated because the kids wouldn't get it. But uh, in heaven, won't it be great to go to class and understand everything perfectly? And there's lots of times when students ask me questions. You know what I have to say? I don't know. Nobody knows. Uh, but not in heaven. In fact, what I, <laughs> what I really like about heaven is he'll answer the question, and then he'll say, want to see? And he'll take you into the laboratory, or maybe he'll, I used to do lots of experiments on my big desk in front of the students, you know, in physics and chemistry particularly. Uh, that's going to be wonderful, folks. And uh, up there, you won't be nearly as dumb as you are now. I, <laughs> I shouldn't have said that. I should have just said that we will all have perfect minds up there, right? <laughs> and that will be helpful, won't it? Be wonderful. Never forget anything. Oh, what a day that will be. The only reason the Lord hesitates, folks, is there are people he wants to see come to a knowledge and give their lives to him. And uh, all of us have friends. Many of us have children who've turned away. Uh, and it's a heartbreak, which reminded me of the wonderful music we sang. Uh, I, I, I loved all three of those hymns. I, I loved the last one, Jesus, Keep Me Near the Cross. I'm going to tell you this story briefly about the thief who was near the cross. Is it wrong to feel like I owe him my life? Indeed not. I do owe him my life. And we should probably thank him every day for it. And that should move us to want to represent him. Amen? And sometimes I don't that, do, do that very well. I'm very ashamed of that. But Jesus was loving and kind and took notice of everybody and whatever need they had. Wonderful plan. That's what he wants us to do, folks. He wants us to be kind to people. And a lot of families today struggle because of the lack of kindness. I noticed that Bill Gates is getting divorced. Did you notice that? And there was one crazy statement there today. If billions and billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars can't make a happy marriage, and I thought, what a poor understanding of happiness and usefulness and a blessed relationship. It all depends, folks, as you know. It depends on Jesus' presence in the members of the home. That's the, loose, that's the solution to every marital problem. Is it right to only ask Jesus for help when we're doing bad? No, folks. That's when we need his help. Maybe more than any time. But we need it all the time. Why did Saul seek out a medium and talk to Samuel? Samuel was dead. I'd love to take more time on that story. Many of you have heard of this. Saul was the king of Israel. And he had slowly drifted away from God until he was being very disobedient. And uh, he realized that his, his time as a king was essentially over. And uh, he, this is very interesting, folks. He should have known better, but he wanted to see Samuel. And he was willing to listen to a devil impersonate Samuel. This is one of the problems of spiritualism and spiritism, as we studied the other night. The devil's angels will be happy to try to pretend like they are the good angels in your life. And uh, it, is, it is claiming the word of God. It is a determination to have your heart surrendered that keeps him from being able to do that. You know what it says in the book of James. The devils believe and they what? They are. When you pray, folks, they run. That's an amazing thing. 
Because angels, the Bible says angels excel in strength. But when you pray, it's wonderful, friends. So there should be kind of a prayer floating around in there all the time. Does that sound familiar? All right. <clears throat> what about suicide? Where has the soul gone? Well, if that person had heard what I said last night and just now, they would understand. The soul doesn't go anywhere, folks. It ceases to exist. Are you all clear on that? Does the Bible say the spirit returns to God in the Bible? Yes, it does. I tricked you. You thought I was saying soul. The spirit, the Bible says the spirit returns to God who gave it. What does that mean? His power that keeps you alive uh, when you die, he, you die because he removes the power. And that's an interesting, complicated situation that we grieve over perhaps, but trusting God is what makes it all right. All right. What about this matter of hell? I told you the other night that I'd been to hell. Do you remember that? There is a little town on the island of Grand Cayman, and the name of the town is Hell. And they have a post office there. And, and the tourists love to go to Hell and send somebody a card. <laughs> and it is postmarked on the card from Hell. <laughs> we didn't do that, but we did drive by and have a look at this post office. And there's, a, there's actually a town. What do you call it when a town organizes itself? The word is escaping me. In, uh, a, a incorporated town. And the name of the town is Hill. But all, oh, and by the way, what sort of started it? There's a, there's a lava, uh, not hot, but a lava a, a, a bed back there that dried. And it kind of looks like maybe there were flames or something. And so that's how it got going. Now, the parable of the sower. Jesus, in Matthew 13, told several parables. And you can picture him out there in the countryside speaking to a large crowd of people. And he spoke to them using a metaphor or a parable to try to describe what's happening with you and me and others who he wants to have in heaven. And uh, a farmer, he said, went out to sow. And he sowed his field, and before long, the wheat, it could have been corn, uh, began to come up. But it was probably a grain, uh, like, uh, like a grass. But before long, the farmer realized that there were some weeds all through his fields. The Bible in the King James calls those tares. It's just an old-fashioned word for weeds. And... Uh, the farmer, when he realized there were five words, uh, four words, and enemy, that's okay. I forget mine once in a while, too. Yeah. Should we have a fine for that? And enemy hath done this, five words. And it's a parable of, the, of Satan, of uh, trying to keep anybody he can on the face of the earth out of heaven. And so he makes, if, they, if we let him, he makes a weed out of us instead of uh, something that Jesus planted that could be harvested. Y'all with me on that? And uh, it's an interesting thing that Jesus said. He, 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 he described the story by saying the the farmer, which really represents God, the farmer's employers, employees said, shall we tear up the weeds? And the farmer said, no, if you tore up the weeds, you tear up the good seed too. So he said, we're going to let the weeds grow until the harvest. And when we reap, we will then separate them. And this is actually a parable, friends, about the end of time. When Jesus comes, it isn't until then that, and we'll, I'll show you this, that the people who are alive and unforgiven, the Bible calls them wicked, which is true. I would just like to emphasize that they could, if they chose to be, they could become the righteous. Is that right? And if the devil ever discourages you, let me ask you this question. Have you ever been discouraged because you did something you're sorry you did? Let me see your hand. You all know about that. 
and God is sorry that you made that mistake, but he wants to forgive you, friends. What a blessing. What a great source, folks, source of a peaceable heart. Amen? Great peace have they that love thy law. And besides that, what does it go on and say? And nothing shall offend them. What a testimony that is, friends. A person who loves Jesus Christ becomes someone that never offends anybody else. Isn't that something? What a gift uh, God has in mind. But in any case, uh, it shows that the people who are unforgiven will live until the time Jesus comes unless they die of old age or whatever and are in the grave. But they're not going to be weeded out until Jesus comes. We'll see this. The field is the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. An enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is what? The end of the world when Jesus comes. In some translations, it says the end of the age, but it, that's what it means. And the reapers are the angels. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing. These are expressions that we don't use. Gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom. Whoever has an ear should listen to this carefully. I'm paraphrasing there, right? So this describes the second coming when the unforgiven people who are living will die. Now, in another place it says in the Bible, they will be destroyed by the brightness of his coming, which brightness is heat, isn't it? So these things are saying essentially the same thing. It's like a fire. It's a sad day, folks, but yet it's a joyful day for those who are saved. And there's this admonition, listen carefully. I've already put two or three people to sleep here this evening. I don't know if it's because it's too warm, but try to stay awake if you can. I'll take the blame. If thy right hand offend thee, cut it off. This is metaphorical, friends. It is profitable for you that one of your members should perish and not that your whole body should be cast into hell. Now, the main purpose of this verse, folks, is to show you that the Bible is clear that there is hell. You'll see clearly that it is not occurring right now. But it's also some instruction. It's metaphorical. Uh, I don't know if I should give you an example, but here goes. Um, I won't even tell you what the relationship is, but I know a young man whose spiritual interest has been destroyed by reading novels. Can you imagine such a thing? I don't see a lot of you nodding firmly, so you're thinking about it. There are things, folks, that we do that make it very difficult for us to walk a righteous life. Is that fair enough? That's what this is saying. Throw it away. Put it aside. I'm really, I'm really getting, what's the word I'm after? I'm getting uh, way too personal. But uh, I'd like you to think about even television. Think about the things, folks, that make your interest in this book decrease. Fair enough? It might be different for you than somebody else. So be careful about t some telling somebody else what they ought to do, right? It's better when the Lord convicts them of what they ought to do. Wouldn't you agree? Now, as a pastor, people come to me sometimes, and maybe I'll be more specific. Maybe I'll do it carefully and ask them a question. I'll, I might ask a question about something that they've mentioned or even probe a little bit. But be careful that we help people be encouraged and not discouraged. But uh, this is a pretty, a pretty good text, isn't it, about whatever's going on in my life or your life that could cause a problem in terms of my walk with Jesus Christ. Very interesting counsel. It's, it's violent enough that he refers to cutting your hand off, see. Uh, so, and this counsel is just for me, just as much for you, friends, believe me. 
Now, there's four things about hell that will help us navigate this story. Number one, the unsaved are not punished until after the judgment at the end of the world. Isn't that what we just read? Are you all with me on this? Now, what we just read didn't speak of the judgment, but if you think about it, God can't tell you you can't be there unless he has looked at the record, if you will, and judged your circumstance. Is that correct? And we'll look more at that. The Bible is clear that there is a judgment. So this is, this is very clear from what we've read so far in the scriptures. Uh, there's a judgment. We're going to look at that tomorrow evening. I think you'll find it fascinating. And uh, based on that judgment, God will make a decision. But the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust. This is another thing now in this same, in this same verse unto the day of judgment to be punished. It's the same story. Uh, he is allowing people to live a life and, of course, appealing to them all the time uh, if they are not wanting to, if, if they are living a, 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 a sinful life uh, until they go to the grave or until Jesus comes. Uh, do, do you not know that the wicked is reserved to the day of destruction? They shall be brought forth to the day of wrath. Some interesting language saying essentially the same thing. This was Job way back in the first book that was ever written. Who shall declare his way to his face? Who shall repay him what he has done? Yet shall he be brought to the grave and shall remain in the tomb. So this is talking about an evil person who has either died before Jesus came or died when Jesus came and he will be in the tomb for now. He doesn't go to hell. And you'll see this in several ways. Let's take another one. The unsaved are punished after the judgment. This is the next one. There are two separate resurrections. I mentioned this briefly, but here's the scripture. This is Jesus speaking himself. Do not be amazed at this, I'm paraphrasing. For the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice. There's coming a time, folks, when everybody that has ever lived will be resurrected. But now then Jesus goes on to say, and I'll, we'll, we'll explain that. Most of you are familiar with the idea, but we'll explain that. He goes on to say, uh, they shall come forth. These, the, you know, that's what he said in the previous part of the verse. But those who have done good will have the resurrection of life. That means eternal life. And those that have done evil unto the resurrection of what? Damnation. So there are two resurrections that Jesus is talking about. Now, there's another one mentioned in the book of Revelation, as you may have remembered from our first night together, the resurrection of those who pierced him. Uh, we're not going to deal with that this evening because we did then. But the rest of the dead, this is from the book of Revelation. This is very interesting. The rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. Stop for a second. He raised a bunch of the dead, correct? He raised the dead people who died righteously. But the rest of the dead will not be raised until the next resurrection. Did you get that? Okay. Uh, and when he says this will be the first resurrection, this is John writing, he's referring to those who were righteous and were resurrected, not to those who will be resurrected later. The fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the whoremongers, the sorcerers, the idolaters, the liars, will all have their part in the lake which burns with fire and burning sulfur. That's what brimstone is. That is the second death. So there are two resurrections and there are two deaths. For the wicked, there are two deaths, as you will see. That's what it's describing. It's describing hellfire here. It is describing hellfire, and it calls that the second death. So let's make a little graph to help make this clear. These two arrows will represent the two resurrections, the first and the second one. And between them, as you will see, well, it just said that, 
the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years was finished. Did I have that whole thing on the screen? Okay. Uh, so that's what we've read so far. Quite clear, actually. And some people call this the millennium. That's fine. That word's not used in the Bible. It doesn't matter that the word isn't used. It just means a thousand years. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word, that's God's power, are kept in store, reserved unto the fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So the hell fire is coming later, as we will see in uh, various verses. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. This is interesting in terms of our first presentation, folks. It, and I, I expressed to you a number of times, I am so amazed that people miss these such clear things. This is one of the five places where it talks about Jesus coming as a thief in the night. And uh, people have uh, interpreted this to be a secret rapture that nobody knows about until it suddenly happens. What does it say here? The heavens will pass away with a great noise. The elements will melt with fervent heat. The earth and also the works that are in there will be burned up. When Jesus comes, folks, that's going to happen to the unsaved people. Are you all with me? But the people that are saved, it will be like, this wonderful experience that they're now going to be taken out of this miserable earth as it is right now to be in heaven. Seeing then that all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be with holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting or making it happen sooner, the coming of Christ, where the heavens will be on fire, and the elements will melt. But the, the, but the people who are saved, all that heat that's destroying the living unforgiven, you all with me on that? It won't bother them. You know, folks, God has charge of all the, all the atoms in the universe. Did you know that? All he has to do is speak. I love this song, Mary, Did You Know? And... Uh, all he has to do is speak, and the waves stop. And everything in the universe obeys his voice. It's, a, it's astonishing. We can't even begin to understand it. I, some, when we're up there in class someday, I don't know if we'll have the nerve to say this. It would, be, it would be interesting to say, would you create something and we could watch while you do it? Wouldn't that be fun? Actually, do you know what? We will. He's going to recreate this earth, and we'll watch it. I kind of think he's going to do it in six days. I don't know that. The Bible doesn't say that. And that'll be very interesting to watch him do what he did so long ago when he made this place. Very fascinating, folks. Fascinating. Where in the heavens being on fire. Okay. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth where there is righteousness. For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance talking now about the living who are unsaved and the year of recompenses for the controversy in Zion. There is a great controversy, friends, going on between Christ and Satan. Satan is accusing Christ, and Christ is giving him time. Follow me now, friends. The Bible doesn't explain this, but it's, you can see it as you, as you grasp what's going on. There will never be anywhere in the universe. And the Bible says that there are many other worlds. You know that, correct? That's in uh, Hebrews, uh, yeah, Hebrews chapter 1. Um, I was going to quote some of it to you, but I need to keep going. But anyway, the, the, here's the issue. Sin arose, and Lucifer, this, this, the highest of all the angels, became proud and felt uh, that he was not being recognized, and he's the one that started all of this. And what's going to keep that from happening again? The Bible doesn't explain it in detail, but it says it will never happen again. And I think what's ha what, what will be part of that is that what happened on this earth will convince anybody, everywhere, anywhere, to not, uh, any time, to not ever have that happen again. And the streams thereof shall be turned into pitch. This is now talking about the earth. 
uh, everything's going to burst into fire. The dust turns into burning sulfur. The land becomes burning pitch. This is describing hell. Uh, but there are two phases of this. One when Jesus comes, and again at the end, as you'll see in a moment, of the, of the millennium. Upon the wicked he shall rain snares and fire and brimstone and horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. This is David speaking. Let's add to these four facts about hell. Hellfire burns on the earth briefly. Did everything we read there kept talking about the earth catching on fire? Right? There's no place somewhere where people go. Uh, now it's going to be uh, when Jesus comes, and then it will happen again as we will read here in just a few moments. <clears throat> Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth which makes it clear that we will be living here, you and I. The meek are describing, folks, the people who are followers of Christ. And we will have the earth as our home. It's going to be at the end of the thousand years, as we will see, but it's promised. Whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. The most famous verse in all the Bible, as you probably know, you hear. And this is the record that God has given us given unto us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Most of you have heard this idea. When God, when you turn your life over to Jesus right now, even though you may physically die, you still have eternal life because God's going to wake you up when he comes. The forgiven people will be resurrected as Jesus uh, returns at the second advent. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son does not have life. This is John writing in there. But doesn't the Bible say the fire is unquenchable? Yes, the idea, folks, is it's unquenchable until it has burned up whatever needs to be burned up. And you'll see that in these couple of verses here. Uh, we read this. Uh, put it in the fire, which cannot be quenched, if something is in your way. Or, or making you have a, a, a turn away from God for some reason. Uh, these people will be as stubble, these people who will be destroyed. The fire shall burn them. They shall not deliver themselves from the power of the flame. There shall not be a coal to warm at, nor a fire to sit before it. So does the fire go out? Yes. It's unquenchable until what is supposed to be burned up is burned up. But the fire will go out, and it's really... Very brief. Doesn't the Bible say eternal fire? I want you to notice something very interesting. Sodom and Gomorrah, you know they were destroyed because they gave themselves, I'm on the third line, to fornication and strange flesh. They are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Most of you know the story. Uh, Lot, Abraham's nephew, uh, Abraham said to him, you know, your flocks are big, my flocks are big, let's not live near each other. Choose where you want to go and I'll take the other place. And Lot, it says, pitched his tent towards Sodom. That's an amazing sentence, folks, that has sparked a lot of sermons because there are people today who are pitching their tent towards Sodom. Oh, they're not doing anything bad yet, but they're doing things or allowing thoughts or what however you want to describe it, that is moving them closer and closer to a bad place. Are you all with me on the idea? So there's a great sermon in that he pitched his tent towards Sodom. Let us determine not to pitch our tents towards Sodom. But the point is, I'm using this text to show you that when God finally did come and jerked Lot and his daughters this is amazing, friends. I, I love the idea that sometimes you and I are so stubborn, the Lord might even just pull us away and save our lives. That's pretty gracious, isn't it? You know, wake you up, if you will. But that's what the angels did. They, the, the, God sent these two angels. It's an amazing story. And finally just took Lot and the daughters and, 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 and Lot's wife 
uh, to get them out of there. And the fire burned up Sodom and Gomorrah and several other small towns around. Is that fire burning today? No. You can go there to the Dead Sea, which now is covering where Sodom and Gomorrah were. There's no fire there. But it's interesting that the Bible writer, in this case Jude, one of the uh, apostles, uh, calls it eternal fire. But uh, it's, an, it's a metaphor that means that the results are eternal. It's clear uh, that the fires of hell are not going to burn forever. Other verses make this clear. Turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them, making them what? An example. So this is how, this is one of the easy ways we can see that hellfire is not going to burn forever, even though sometimes that word is used to express the results. The, the day comes that will burn as an oven. All the proud, the wicked, will be stubble. The day that comes shall burn them up. It shall leave them neither root nor branch. And unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and you will go forth and grow up. This is to all of you folks, all of us, who turn our, loaves, our lives over to Christ. You will, and I'm reading this verse because the next part of it says, and you will tread on the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, says the Lord of hosts. In other words, hell takes place on this earth where we will live after the millennium, and it's as though as we're walking on their ashes. Now, I don't think physically the ashes will be there anymore, but the idea, folks, is this is where it will happen, not some other place, and it's not happening now. There is no such thing as burning hellfire at this time. So the fire doesn't continue to burn, this is my comment, if there's only ashes there. It's unquenchable only because the fire uh, has finished burning. But doesn't the Bible say their worm will not die? I'm just bringing up texts, folks, that some people, some pastors, will get up and preach about eternal hell. And uh, if your foot offends you, this is a very similar verse. Cast it into hell, fourth line, the fire that shall never be quenched, where the worm dieth not. This is an expression of the life like the worm that makes the butterfly or something like that. And uh, um, it's not going to be um, something that tries to say that the fire keeps on burning. Doesn't the Bible speak of everlasting punishment? It does. These shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Now, somebody could stumble. I told you, I think, the first night we were here that... Uh, if you just took one text someplace, maybe like this one, you might get the idea that hell is burning forever. This is why you need to look widely through the Bible, and I'm just going to I'm just going to remind you of something. Uh, punishment is different than punishing. The results of the punishment are eternal, but the punishing doesn't go on for eternity. Is the idea that's going on here. If you're troubled, rest with us, says Paul, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. This is the second coming. That's what he's talking about. In flaming fire, the, the unforgiven uh, who do not know God will, be, will die. That's not hell yet. They're going to be re-resurrected. I'll show you that. Some, most of you have heard of that thing. They, they will be punished with everlasting destruction uh, because of God's power. So let's add one more thing here. The wicked will be wiped out of existence at the end. Let me show you how that works now with some graphs. Do not fear those who kill the body. Fear those who destroy the body and the soul in hell. An admonition worth listening to. The wicked will perish 
And the enemies of the Lord will be as the fat of the lambs. They shall consume into smoke. They, they shall consume away. Note, consume. The fire, in other words, goes out. Yet a little while the wicked shall not be. In other words, it won't be very long until that happens. But the, doesn't the Bible say the smoke ascends forever and ever? Here's the, here's the, here's the verse. Uh, I mean, sorry. I'm, I'm wanting to show you. I, sh I will show you the verse, but I'm wanting to show you how the Bible sometimes used forever, and it doesn't mean that the way you might think. So this is in the Old Testament. You have a servant that serves you forever. Uh, how long will that servant serve his master? Until he is gone. So the Bible sometimes uses the word forever to talk about something that goes on until uh, it's, for whatever reason, not needed or continues. Here's another one. Here's Hannah. She was childless, and she went and prayed, and she became pregnant. And she's talking about his child in the fifth line, that he may appear before the Lord and there abide for what? How long did Samuel live? Did he live forever? No. So the, it, we're just showing that sometimes that word is used. And again, if you look at everything that speaks to an issue, it usually becomes quite clear. Wherefore, this is she still speaking, I have lent him to the Lord as long as he liveth. So for her, forever meant as long as what? as long as he was alive. Just to show you that sometimes this word is used, and be careful uh, how you interpret that without taking some care. Then shall the king say unto them, this is Jesus, come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And then shall he say unto them on the left hand, these are the people who are unforgiven, depart from me, you cursed, into what? By the way, that everlasting fire which only means until it burns up. What was, the, what was it designed for? God doesn't want, folks, a single person to be lost. This fire is designed for the angels who cannot repent. That's a whole other story. Uh, you can go too far. There is such a thing, folks, as an unpardonable sin. That is to say, don't misunderstand that idea. I have a whole sermon on that we can't take the time for this week. But I can go so far in sin that I don't want to ever be forgiven. It's not that God couldn't forgive me if I wanted him to, but I can get to the place where I don't even want to anymore. That's the unpardonable sin. So don't be afraid. I've had, you know, some of you have maybe struggled with this. I've had a number of people through the years. I, I was... Uh, I was making an appeal on the very last meeting we were holding. This was in, in the Seattle area. And um, a lot of people responded. People left after the service. But there was a man that stayed right. I'll point to it because he was in the second row, right? I can still picture in that chair. And his shoulders were heaving. What was he doing? He was crying. So I walked over and sat down beside him. And I waited a few moments. And then spoke to him. He felt like he had done some things that were so bad he could never be forgiven. But by God's grace, I was able to encourage him and help him to know that God loves to forgive. The problem is wanting to be forgiven. Amen? And if I go too far, the Holy Spirit finally leaves and it's only, folks, the Holy Spirit that makes you want to be forgiven. Are you with me on that? That's a whole study in itself. So the problem with this thing we call the unpardonable sin is, I go so far in iniquity that the Holy Spirit finally gives up. And I, I can't be sorry without the Holy Spirit. I don't feel like you've done that, folks. The fact that you're here means that you are still in God's desire to save you. Be very careful. Be very careful about letting the enemy talk you into that you might be that person. God is so merciful, folks. But there is a problem if we aren't uh, wise. Prepared for the devil and his angels. That's what that fire is designed for. All right. 
when and where. Marvel not at this. This is John now, again. For the hours coming in which all that are in the graves will hear his voice, they shall come forth. We read this. Jesus is speaking, I'm, I'm sorry, in John's gospel, he's quoting Jesus. These two resurrections. And there they are again, the first and second, with the millennium in between them. The rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. So let me put on this screen uh, some marks that will help you put all this together. Blessed and holy is he that par has part in the first resurrection. On such, the second death hath no power. Stop a minute. There's two resurrections, and there's two deaths. There's the first resurrection, the second resurrection, the first death, the second death. I'll put them all on the screen just to help make you clear on all of this that we're reading. Uh, no power, the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and shall reign with him a thousand years. We're talking about the millennium. So here's how it works. The saints are in heaven. They have been the living forgiven and the dead forgiven who were resurrected are all taken to heaven. And uh, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. This is him coming, the second coming. The dead in Christ shall rise first. This is 1 Thessalonians, one of the clearest descriptions of what we're talking about this evening. The Lord comes, the forgiven dead are resurrected. The unforgiven dead know nothing at this point. And uh, then, once those people are resurrected, we which are alive and remain, we we're still here, will be caught up together with them. Who's them? The people that were forgiven and died but are resurrected. The first thing happens, they're resurrected. Then you and I, if we're, by God's grace, are still living when he comes, we will be caught up together with them to meet the Lord where? In the air. Uh, I'm not going to get into this in depth. I touched on it earlier, folks. When the devil personates Christ, he will be walking on the earth, probably performing miracles and wowing the whole world. And people will flock to him. He will claim to be Christ and claim all kinds of things that are, that are truth. He'll say, that's not important. But you, who know what the word says, will know it's not Christ because Christ never touches the earth when he comes. Are you with me? We meet him where? In the air. And are taken then, uh, not uh, taken to heaven. We don't stay here yet on this earth. We come back there later. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Uh, the word is not used, the word rapture is not used, but the Greek word does mean caught up. But it's not a secret rapture, is it? What has happened? Man, a bunch of dead people were raised up. It was noisy. There was a trumpet sound. Are you all with me on this? Amazing how people get this so crooked. I'm just astonished uh, how that happens. But by God's grace, you're not getting it crooked. Amen? All right. So Christ's second coming, the righteous dead are raised, the righteous living are caught up with them, uh, the wicked or the unforgiving living, die from the brightness of his coming, from what seems to be like fire at the moment. And uh, Paul says, I'm showing you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. When he says we shall not all sleep, what is he referring to? Death. In a moment, we're going to be changed. This is you and me. Let's assume that we're all in Christ, he has come, and you and I have, we have problems, folks. We struggle with being what God wants us to be. Is that correct? But we're going to be changed. In a moment. In what? Just the, what that means is how long it takes to blink your eye. And uh, we will be, uh, and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall also be changed in the same way, if you will. For this corruptible will put on incorruption, and this mortal will put on immortality. When he comes, 
That change is immortal life for us. And what a day that will be. And of course, by God's grace, he is delaying it, folks. Oh, I'm thankful that he's delaying it. Because of people that you and I love that need to be there. So the saved living and the saved dead who are raised, then there's the lost ones who are living and the lost who are still dead. I'm going to put some lines on here that represent living and not being living. So the yellow line means that the saved people, when Jesus comes just before or at the first resurrection, they live forever. The saved dead, the black line means when Jesus comes at the moment, what are they? They're dead, but they become living. They're resurrected, and they live forever. Are you all with me? Those who are, and notice when that happens. That's the first resurrection. Let not your heart be troubled, Jesus said. Believe in me. In my Father's house are these mansions. I am going to prepare a place for you. I'm reading it more quickly than I would maybe normally. And if I'm going, I will come again and receive you, that where I am, there ye may be also. What a promise. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Let me picture it for you. The rest of the dead. First of all, there are the people who are lost because they're unforgiven. They die at that same moment and are dead until the second resurrection. The lost who are dead are dead until the second resurrection. Are you all with me so far? The lost living and the lost dead are both resurrected at the second resurrection. Jesus called this first resurrection, let's see if I can't make my arrow big enough for you to really see it, but that's the first resurrection. He called that the resurrection of life. What did he call this resurrection over here? The resurrection of damnation. These people will be raised. And at that point in time, everybody that has ever lived will be alive. He raises them, right? He raises the uh, unrighteous who were dead when he came, and he raises the unrighteous who were living when he came. And... Uh, for a short time, a very short time, until hell fire, they are resurrected. The slain of the Lord shall be that, be at that day from one end of the earth to the other. They shall not be lamented, neither gathered nor buried. They shall be dung upon the, upon the ground. That's referring to the death uh, that occurs shortly after the second resurrection. So let's take a look at that. At this point in time, when these people are resurrected, as I showed you a moment ago. The Lord makes the earth empty. He makes it waste. He turns it upside down and scatters abroad. Um, I'm going to, just the third from the last line, the land shall be utterly empty, utterly spoiled, for the Lord has spoken his word. And I'll tell you what he's referring to there. The earth is broken down. It's, it's just, it's dissolved. Uh, The transgression of the people are heavy upon it. He's referring to the fact that when Christ comes, it's that the earth is in a terrible condition. But uh, John says, I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold upon the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. I'm taking another little piece of this picture, that during the millennium, the Bible says that Satan is bound and thrown into the bottomless pit. Now, this, this bottomless pit, Greek word, is abusos, which just means it's really referring to the earth uh, in its current state. But it does mean, as somebody just said out loud, it refers to the abyss. But I want to explain something to you that I don't have time to get into in detail. It's not that the devil is put in some hole somewhere. It's talking about a condition. The devil is going to be bound he can't leave this earth. He has to walk around here for a thousand years looking at the mayhem that he caused. There's nobody living on the earth now. The, the dead forgiven and the, and the living forgiven have gone to heaven with God. 
and there's this thousand years called the millennium, cast, him, cast the devil into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he cannot deceive the nations. Why can he not deceive the nations? Because nobody's alive on the earth until the thousand years is finished. And after that, he will be loosed. This is in Revelation chapter 20. And I told you earlier, the description in chapter 20 and 21 is the most helpful place in the whole Bible to see how these things proceed, even though we've read a lot of scriptures that help make us understand it as well. So here we go. Satan is bound. Uh, put quotes around that bound. He can't leave the earth. And can you imagine what the earth is like, folks? Everything is broken down. Earthquakes. The Bible says in Revelation, every mountain was moved out of its place. Every island was moved out of its place. Uh, and the kings of the earth and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and the free men and the bond men called for the rocks and the earth to fall on them. That's, that's happening when Jesus is coming, see. And now here's this mess uh, where all the unforgiven are dead. All the forgiven are in heaven. And the Lord for, does this for a thousand years. But the Bible doesn't tell us this. I mentioned this last night. I think, friends, that that thousand years is for time for you and me to understand why someone we were hoping would be there is not there because there are books. The Bible says, folks, there are books that record everything we've ever done in our life. I told you already, those of us who are there, our books will be cleaned of anything we did wrong. Is that good news? Boy, that's good news, folks, I'll tell you. <laughs> Satan is bound. When the thousand years are expired, Satan, this is Revelation 20, shall be loosed out of his prison, and he will go out and deceive the nations, which are in the four quarters of the earth. How can he go deceive people? What has happened? The second resurrection, which Jesus said, is the resurrection of damnation. Now, all the people... Every, any time through the history of the earth that are unforgiven are now alive. The people who, now don't misunderstand me, maybe the man who invented the atomic, atomic bomb. I actually have met the man who created the hydrogen bomb. Uh, and I don't know whether he's going to be saved at last, but just imagine that, uh, that there would be these people. I can imagine that they might assemble an air force and they might build atomic bombs. Who knows, folks? Uh, there's going to be a lot of brilliant people who died unforgiven that are going to be there. And besides that, they've got Satan's power and all the evil angels. So who knows? But what happens is, it says in the Bible, uh, they gather together, and their number is almost unlimited. So what we have here is this second resurrection, and it describes them uh, when John saw God bringing the new Jerusalem, which is now in heaven. He brings that city to this earth. Uh, and it's like a bride prepared for her husband. It's beautiful. Uh, we don't have any idea how beautiful and what it's going to be like. This is just a, this is a description of this beautiful city. Uh, the walls are made of stone, but the walls, you can see right through them. Uh, the pavement, what's the pavement in heaven? Gold. I shouldn't tell you this story, but I'm going to. I don't want to make any, in any way light of this, but it illustrates something. According to the standard theology, this man comes to heaven uh, with, his, with all his wealth, and he meets St. Peter at the gate. And St. Peter says, uh, you can't bring that stuff in here. And the man pleads with him. He says, oh, I, I've kept this all my life, and I, 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 I want to bring it. Can't you talk to somebody? So the story goes. So St. Peter goes inside. I guess he talks to God, and uh, he makes this appeal. And God says, so what did he bring? And St. Peter says, pavement. Nothing we have on this earth, folks, is worth a dime, is it? That's right. 
He showed me this wonderful city. Now it's back to the people that have been resurrected in the resurrection of damnation. It says they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about. This is the city in which, by God's grace, all of us will be in that city. After the thousand years, that city is, uh, of us being in heaven, that city is brought to this earth. And actually, the Bible says it's going to be planted right uh, in uh, where Jerusalem is now. It's an interesting story. We won't get into that tonight. And, they, and the wicked, if you will, along with the evil angels, compass the camp of the saints. They, they come around the city. They're going to try to take the city, probably. And Satan has got them up to think they have the power to take the city. And What comes down from heaven, friends? This is hellfire. And what does it do? It devours them. It's a very brief, horrible thing, but it will cleanse the earth and destroy forever those who chose not to be forgiven. So that's hellfire, very briefly. And it occurs right there after, after, at the end of the millennium, a short time after uh, all the unforgiven are raised. The Bible actually says that just before this fire uh, comes down, that every knee on earth will bow including all the evil angels, and say, God was right. They will not be forced to do that, folks. They will see it and be compelled, if you will. Uh, I don't have that verse to put up here, but it's in Revelation, as you know. So uh, that's the story with hellfire. And that blue is like black forever without any possibility of resurrection. Is that clear enough? Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore, I will bring forth a fire. This is speaking of, of Satan himself. It shall devour you, and I will bring to you to ashes upon the earth. And then the Bible says there will be a new heaven and a new earth. Now, I want to take just a few more minutes. We're only two minutes over. Uh, Tomorrow evening is going to be a challenge. You're going to really have to put your thinking caps on. But uh, I want to just have you turn in your Bibles, if you would, with me to Hebrews chapter 9. Please do this, folks. I don't want to put it on the screen. I want you to see it with your own eyes in your own Bible. And if you don't have one, look on your neighbors with him or her. Hebrews chapter 9. And I probably should have drawn this the other way last night. Normally, when we draw something on a map, what direction is up? That's north. So what direction is left? West. And the reason, whenever the sanctuary was built or then moved, every time the Israelites pitched another camp somewhere else, the... Uh, priests uh, who did some work outside here. There's an altar of, of where the lambs were slain, and there was a place where they washed their feet. Uh, and, then they, and then a priest would go inside. His back, I'm sorry, <laughs> I was drawing it like I did last night. I apologize. Uh, so here is... Uh, here is this veil I drew. This is the most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant is. Are you all with me on that? And here's the altar of incense. And I wanted, I wanted the back of the priest as he comes in here to be facing what direction? Why? Because the sun rises in the east, and that's when sun worshipers bow and worship the sun. So the sanctuary was always positioned so that as the priest went inside, his back was facing the east where the sun was. So it was clear that he wasn't worshiping the sun. There's actually a place in the book of Ezekiel where some of, the, of God's priests are worshiping the sun, the 
frightening situation. But uh, nevertheless, that's, that's the way I should have drawn it last night. And I already started drawing it the wrong way for a moment. So here's that altar where the lambs are slain. And here's that uh, fount, if you will, where they could wash their feet. And uh, on top of this throne are two angels. They're called the covering cherub. And this box, this chest, represents God's throne. So all through the years that this tent was being moved from place to place, you couldn't see it as an observer out here. And only the high priest ever went inside here once a year. But there was a bright, shining light sitting just above the top of that chest, representing God's presence. It's called in the Bible the Shekinah glory. And the interesting thing, among the interesting things about this church, this tabernacle, this sanctuary, is that it's a pattern of the church in heaven. Last night I had you look in the last part of chapter 11, the very last verse. Remember what it says? And the temple of God was open, remember, in heaven. And there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. So God's throne is represented by this chest made of gold. And when he said in Exodus 25, verse 8, to the Israelites, to Moses, let them build me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them, he actually came and dwelt there. That, that bright light, folks, did not represent God if in his absence somewhere. He was there. He said that I may dwell among them. Amazing. The time came when the Israelites became so unconnected from God that that light went out. By the time Jesus was on this earth and Solomon's temple had been destroyed and now Herod's temple was there, so-called, and... Uh, the, and, and, and the ark was no longer around. There was no longer a light there in the temple that represented God. But that's the idea that God was having here. And in front of the uh, curtain uh, was this altar of incense where the priest uh, would put some incense and the smoke would rise and go up over the top of this curtain and kind of conduct the bright light can you get what I'm talking about? Uh, if there was some smoke in this room and it leaked out through the door and there was a very bright, bright, bright light outside, would the smoke kind of bring some of that light in here? You all with me on that? And sometimes that smoke conducting, if you will, the light over the top of the veil was so bright that the priest had to get out. Couldn't, couldn't stand it. Interesting. Now, let's read together in... Uh, uh, get this pen put back together, in Hebrews chapter 9. Are you all pleased there? Okay. Then truly, the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary, referring to this one, the first covenant, the old covenant, if you will, the one that God made with them in the wilderness, and they had this sanctuary. <clears throat> For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which I didn't draw. The candlestick was over here. The menorah, have you heard that term? The seven branch candle. And then over here was this table with bread. And all of these symbols represented Jesus. He's the light of the world. He's the bread of life. And, of course, it's his glory as well as his father's glory that's here. So when it says, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table of showbread, it's referring to this part of the sanctuary. And then it says, after the second veil, because this was actually a veil as well that the people could not see through. 
it was like this was too holy for them to just be looking at. And the priest would slip through the, a crack in the veil and come in and do his work. After the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, or some, sometimes the most holy place, uh, which had the golden censer, sitting on the ground here was a little golden cup that uh, also had coals in it, so the priest would put incense on those coals and waft it back and forth as he walked in there. And remember, the smoke from that incense, as well as the altar of incense, represented the fact that Jesus' righteous life could stand in the place of mine, and so it was safe for me to come in God's presence. Got it? The golden pot, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called it, which had the golden censer, and the Ark of the Covenant, that's the, that's the chest, uh, overlaid round about with gold, except for the top of it, which was solid gold, maybe two or three inches thick. Wherein was, you know, in that chest was what? Well, the first thing it says here, a golden pot, that they had saved some manna. That was in there in a golden pot. And then Aaron's rod. Some of you remember the story. I won't take the time right now. Uh, Aaron's, Aaron's, we were out walking with some friends today, and, and the, the man had a stick. The stick was dead, but it was still wood, right? Aaron's rod was just dead wood. But one time, God wanted the people to understand who had authority, and uh, Aaron's rod overnight got leaves and made buds and made almonds overnight. That's why... It's in here. It's such a symbol of God's power, see. And Aaron's rotted butted. And the tables of the covenant. What's that? The Ten Commandments. So uh, this picture, this tent, in fact, it says this. Uh, let me have you read it. Uh, and over it, that's, this is verse 5, over it the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat. This, the top this solid gold lid on this thing was called what? Why is it called the mercy seat? Because that's where God sits. Isn't that a great idea? Of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now, when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone, once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself, and for the heirs of the people. This is an interesting story. I've got to stop this now. But the priests, folks, were sinners. And before they ever offered a sacrifice for the people, they had to offer one for themselves. Except the high priest, Jesus Christ, who it says in chapter 10, he didn't have to do that. That's a very interesting story. All right. I'll, I'll quit uh, with that for, the, for now. But let me just give you a little hint. Uh, I wanted to read for you a little bit more, where it talks about the fact uh, that uh, in heaven there is this temple, that uh, this thing is a pattern of that. Here's the issue. You know about this. Once every year, Jewish people have what they call Yom Kippur, right? I can't even spell it for sure. But uh, I don't know if you've thought of this before. It represents judgment because the Israelites, once a year, were told they had to fast for three days. It was such a strict fast that there was no marriage relationship, no intimacies. And they were to examine their hearts and make sure every sin was confessed. And on that day, that's the only day in the whole year and only the high priest would go and actually go inside the most holy place. And if anybody in the camp had an unforgiven sin, he would die. So Yom Kippur, most people have no idea of this, represents judgment. Are you all with me on this? And there is a judgment coming upon this earth which the Bible writers use this story 
to tell you when the judgment is coming. That's going to be our topic tomorrow night. Let's pray. Father, I thank you again for your mercy. We are so grateful, Lord. Unworthy, thankful. I think all of us in this room, Lord, have people in our families that don't know you. We lift them up just now, Father. You have said that when we pray, your arm is moved in ways it wouldn't have been if we hadn't asked. So here we are, Lord, we're asking. Everybody in this room, perhaps, at this moment, is lifting up to you in their heart a request for someone. And just asking again for forgiveness, Lord. Help us to see if there's something that we haven't admitted to you. Oh, Lord, save us all at last, I pray in Jesus' name.